our next session here is uh, book launch nadim parachas for faith state and the soul nadim paracha in conversation with george fulton hello everybody assalamualaikum welcome to this session i am delighted to be moderating this session um now about six months ago i was moderating another session and it was another book of nadim's that i was moderating and that was his sixth book in about six years and now we are on to the seventh book and that that session i described nadim as being nauseating because he really is that prolific and now i don't know what other word to use because he is producing books at such a staggering rate but i am delighted that he's here today to talk about this new book of his which is for faith state and the soul a history of popular culture in pakistan and it is a truly beautiful looking book and um it is uh, a history of popular culture in pakistan so now for those who don't know and i'm sure there aren't many um nadim is a renowned journalist culture critic satirist as well as author and historian and um and but nadim i would say that you're you are known primarily in for certainly for a lot of your uh, readers of your newspaper columns as a cultural critic so my question first question to you is how come it took you so long to write a book on popular culture it has mostly to do with the by the unfortunate fact that when it comes to um, popular culture in pakistan uh it can be music it can be folk music and be qawali naat whatever theater cinema one when one is conscious of what happened in the past and how things evolved but it is not very well documented i started this project basically back in 1999 because when people say popular culture a lot of people think you're talking about pop music pop music is just one aspect of this culture this culture is basically uh, or actually emerged as a culture which was created by the people for the people and it is largely created from below and then either used or exploited above but when i set out to do a book on popular culture i realized and i i i went through libraries and especially don library and other stuff i talked to people a lot of people had these nostalgic tales about what used to be but they didn't have any concrete uh, evidence of what they were saying there were i couldn't find any in magazines old magazines i couldn't find any old uh, uh, research done on it so i sort of gave up almost but then in 2018 i had got the chance to visit uh, washington dc as a research fellow and i was there for about 5 6 months and there the kind of sources i uh, i came across i was baffled especially the library of congress over there had so much material on my country especially to do with these things which i have written about and that sort of energized me and gave me the what i was looking for so so they they sort of provided a lot of the, lot of the proof yes. for what you'd heard yeah. but they had historical evidence yeah yeah and, and that is also what i realized what i'd heard was largely exaggerated sometimes can, can, can you give an example of what you found for example uh, when we talk about qawali we assume that the urdu qawali has been around for hundreds of years mm. what i found out i i came across a paper written by an indian scholar in 1964 so i i i actually uh, got that paper from the library of congress the urdu qawali is purely a creation of pakistan there was no nothing called the urdu qawali 
in this region till the 1950s. Achha. And it was created by the Sabri brothers, most of the time, mostly. And why was it created? Basically, because Kavali till then was either historically sung in Arabic, but mostly in Persian. Urdu Kavali came into being when Radio Pakistan decided to, okay, we'll now have Kavali, which was being sung outside Mazars, Sufi shrines. So they wanted to start uh, started on uh, Radio Pakistan. And the reason was because the 1953 anti-Amadiya riots had happened. So the state of Pakistan started uh, realizing that they have to come up with some new version of Islam, which was softer, to blunt the, the, the narrative of uh, those who were out there uh, attacking the enemies, uh, the Ahmadis, etc. So they, they thought that Kavali is a good idea. But then they told Radio Pakistan to start doing the Kavali in Urdu and incorporate Iqbal, Iqbal's poetry. So that is how the Urdu Kavali started. Now, but you were saying earlier, you were saying that popular culture was a bottom-up uh, coming together of, of culture. From, from the Avam, but this was the state imposing cultural practices on the people. Yeah, that's the interesting bit about Pakistan. Popular culture as a term was first used in England. And what was it? Due to industrialization and modernization that had started to kick off a peak from the 19th century onwards, the city started to grow. And a lot of people from smaller towns and villages started to come to the cities to work in the factories. But they got lost over there. It was chaos. And uh, they had their own culture, the folk culture, but nobody was interested in that. And they were pressurized to become modern as well. So what they created was a fusion between, in, uh, 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 what they created was a modernity, which was basically, or their version of modernity. For example, they used the printing press to publish racy novels, you know, sensationalist novels. They started printing uh, newspapers which we now call tabloids, with exaggerated stories and everything. So what I'm trying to say is basically the popular culture was a culture which was being created by the people below, the working classes in urban areas and been consumed and they were also its main consumers. But what happened in Pakistan was, when Pakistan was created, the urban areas didn't have a very large working class. Let's talk about Karachi. Like Karachi, before partition, had a lot of trading traders. They had a, a, a working class as well, but it wasn't big enough. So in Pakistan, popular culture or popular culture products were basically designed by the state from above. You know, like give you in the Kavali, for example. Popular culture events were happening below as well, but they weren't part of the mainstream. Um, and what is very interesting and telling about this book, and it's really quite cynical how the state was dialing up and dialing down the popular culture elements to suit its purposes. You mentioned the introduction of Kuali on Radio Pakistan after the anti Ahmadi riots in the 50s. Um, they were also sort of taking uh, folk singers and dancers to the foreign, uh, for foreign uh, trips abroad, but were largely ignoring the, that those people here in Pakistan. And then y later on, you had Bhutto adopting sort of Sufi socialism and, yes. and those sort of traits. And each, each, whether it be Ayub, whether it be Bhutto, each successive uh, um, administration sort of latched onto elements that they wanted to use. Uh, and then that sort of went away to, to some extent. Do you, do you say? Yeah. Um, like I said, it was going on. But the state of Pakistan in the first 25 years of the country had uh, a particular kind of a, 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 a model of what a modern Muslim majority state should be. Should be modern, it should not 
uh, be uh, patronizing things like superstitious beliefs, mm. you know, and uh, stuff like that. So they wanted, and it was the thinking was very urban because it was being driven by a state elite and by a slowly growing middle urban middle classes, especially those which had who had uh, come from India. Right. You know, so they had and. Things like uh, um, Mazar, Sufis, and stuff like that, uh, they were happening, but they were kept at bay. They were never part of the official or uh, a national uh, uh, image that the state was trying to create. But at the same time, what the state did was it started to nationalize these popular culture products. Again, like Kavali, it was happening. There were Kavals who were uh, doing the Kavali outside Mazars. But when the state adopted it, it molded it according to its own narrative. It started, it, it, it became Urdu. Then uh, they said to incorporate Iqbal's poetry. And another thing, interesting thing is, for example, during Bhutto's time, now we take things like the Nath right. as if it's been, it's been there all the time. But very few of us know that the Nath actually became popular in 1974 when for the first time a Nath was uh, recorded and played uh, on PTV. Yeah. And I tried to get into the history of what the Nath was, where, did, where was it coming from. There was no history of the Nath. There was something that maybe in the 18th, 19th century, um, someone was doing this sort of thing. But it's still a very modern creation. It is basically a state or a cultural elite trying to create something for the uh, uh, lower middle classes and the working classes through which they can regulate these classes and control them. You know? For example, in 1974, when the Nath was for the first time played on PTV, that was the Bhutto regime's way of saying to the people who he knew had these sort of beliefs, which were very not modernistic, just to make sure that it doesn't erupt, or it doesn't come back as a, as, as a backlash against what the state was trying to do. Because till then, the state was trying to enforce a certain sort of modernity. Mm. And there was turmoil because the population was growing and the cities were growing and the cities had more working class people, people coming from rural areas with their old stuff. That's why we, in, in, during Bhutto's period, we also started seeing folk music on television and uh, uh, radio. And, and also you saw in that period, there was a real tension between traditional folk, um, uh, indigenous cultural uh, elements and also um, elements that have been adopted or co-opted from Western audiences. You know, you had Wahid Murad coming yeah. in as this uh, chocolate box hero and yeah. uh, adopting the sort of teddy boy look and, um, you know, pop music was coming in as well. And so there was a, that intention between the traditional, the the uh, Pakistani and the Western. Yeah, it was it was a way to define what Pakistani popular culture or modern popular culture means. They couldn't sort of uh, adopt uh, like till even the 1980s. You know, um, there were how many people would have bought, let's say, pop records? But people were conscious that there was something called pop music going on in the West. So what they did was they started to create their own pop, pop music, like Vahid Murad, the Coco Corina song, right. the 1966 movie. That it was an attempt to doing that. It adopted a lot of elements and musical elements from what was happening in the West, and then it, they added it to the filmy sentimentality and poetry of film music, and uh, people jumped at that, you know, and uh, they didn't feel alienated as such. Had Vareed Morat, for example, come and started singing an Elvis song, for example, mm. he wouldn't have gotten that sort of traction. He would have looked alien. Right. You know, but if he has a certain sort of a haircut and he's singing this sort of a song, which sounds, it is in Urdu and sounds both Pakistani and Western, he 
he got away with that. And it was about Coca-Cola, wasn't it? It was basically about a Coca-Cola bottle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you're singing about, okay. Um, and then we saw sort of after post Bhutto in the, in, in Ziar's period, did we see, we saw an emergence of a much more stronger indigenous culture and less of a grip of, of, of the Western imports. And you talk about, I mean, the, it really is a great book. I'm, I'm, I must buy it. Um, for example, I learned from this book that the term burger to, to, to uh, describe a westernized, uh, you know, Pakistani was, had, was, uh, was created by Umar Sharif, which I didn't know. And it, people like Umar Sharif and these kind of um, uh, comedians and artists were coming through in the 80s and the 90s with much more um, uh, sort of uh, local language and local terminology coming through. And, and was the state losing a bit of control? Yes, that is the period, I would say, from mid-80s and onwards, late 80s, when, when popular culture started being uh, created by the people below the state. Right. You know, that is when uh, things started to expand. Because remember, the, the population was always growing. It was, you know, cities were getting bigger and uh, more and more people were going, uh, kids were going to schools and colleges and they were being uh, exposed to a lot of uh, uh, Indian material, for example. And uh, there was more exchange between classes as well, I would say. So if a person like from uh, Lalu Khet, which is now Liaquatabad, Umar Sharif, a young Umar Sharif comes across a guy who's from Defense of Clifton, mm. The first thing you know comes to mind is burger, huh. yeah. Because Umar Sharif was having bun kebab, and he sees, the, and that is why he created uh, the, the 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 term burger, which we still use, and very few people know that was Umar Sharif. He was the one who 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 created this word, and it became part of the popular uh, Karachi lingo, for example, and uh, that is when state, which was trying to regulate the emotions, the sentiments, and the thinking of the people by creating its own or trying to control popular culture products, started to lose it, and the people below, they started to create it. And is, is this why you think sort of we saw this upswing in, in pop music and, and uh, rock music in sort of towards the end of the the Zia period and during the that early as, as as a reaction yes as a reaction it was a, a portion of a middle class which uh, young middle class people young youngsters who were reacting to what they had to suffer under Zia, but eventually that 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 uh, that impulse was authentic I would say for a very brief period because it was then co-opted by multinationals and all that. But at the same time, in during the same um, uh, uh, pop explosion of the 1990s, we saw people again from lower middle class areas, like Salim Javed, for example, Tehseen Javed, for example, you know, Hawa, Hawa, and all that. Mm. You know, they were never. Alamgir. Uh, Alamgir, yeah, in the 80s. But these guys were never co opted, like the Cokes and Pepsis were never interested in Hawa, Hawa, for example. So what I'm trying to say is their popularity was authentic and genuine. Their music was far more authentic in coming from their actual experiences as coming from uh, working class or lower middle class families. Um, unlike the Vital Signs and other bands, mm. they were doing a good job, but they were already coming from an elite privileged classes. Right. They did some good work, but then uh, the authenticity because you see, popular culture, a lot of people think that it's the popular culture products are not authentic. It depends how you see it. If it's really coming from, let's say there was a, during the same period of time, there was something called the Liari Disco genre. That song, uh, the 80, 87-88 song on Benazir, Jia uh, Bhutto Benazir, which was composed in Liari, by a Liariite, and it was a product of what is called the Liari disco scene. And it was just in Liari. They had created their own little studios. They used to make tapes of uh, Balochi songs. 
and uh, they they found a market but that i see is as a authentic popular culture uh, phenomena yeah great okay uh, before i open up to uh, questions from the audience i'm going to do a something that i haven't done before with you nadim it's going to be rapid fire round okay <laughs> so i want short answers uh, but it's all about culture so don't worry um, so what do you think is the most successful enduring popular culture in pakistan enduring political slogans political political okay great um what was the mo most un uh, interesting fact you found out when researching this book the qawali one which i've already mentioned that the urdu qawali was a creation of pakistan okay uh, and what is your favorite Pakistani song, film, and book? Song is the the Liari one I was talking about. Jia Bhutto Benazir. Yeah. I love the beat, and it just it 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 has aged so well. It still moves you, and so it's like almost thirty years old. My favorite book. Yeah. Uh, Pakistani, not pa one of your own. No, no, Pakistani book. Well, there are so many. Um, there's so many because film, I'm film. Okay, my favorite Pakistani film would be Mola Jet, the original one. I haven't seen the new one, so maybe that's good as well. But the original one. No, I ain't seen it. Okay, and uh, uh, television series. Khuda ki basti. Ah, great. Okay, well, thank you very much, Nadim. And now I would like to, uh, um, really, this is, I'm, I've got, I'm, I'm getting, giving him his money's worth. This is really a beautiful book. Uh, oh, yeah, I just want to, before, before I ask, go okay, open to the questions, can I just give a shout out uh, to the illustrator, Farooq Ahmed? It is just a beautiful book. You've got all these beautiful illustrations here. I don't know if you can see it, uh, and as well as, obviously, the words. They are all handmade. And uh, the artist was just absolutely yeah, I mean, brilliant. Just, just stunning. Yeah. Um, okay, so can I uh, open it up now to you? Anyone who would like to ask Nadim a question? Uh, the gentleman in the green, uh, I think it's green. Yeah, let's just check. Yeah, the, you, you, sir. My name is Mr. Sonaula, and my question is that <coughs> sir, my name is Mr. Sonaula, and my question is that how you found the Baloch nation in popular culture oh. currently? Like I said, uh, it was a struggle. It took me about 11 years to write this book, and uh, unfortunately, The places where one goes to, f to, to look for sources, there was so little on Baloch culture, so little. But I did talk to a lot of people, especially in Liari, the Baloch living there. <coughs> they told me a lot of stuff, which I've used in my previous book as well, where the people came from, especially in Liari. But unfortunately, there was nothing, in most of it were, were oral, oral source, uh, sources. There was nothing documented as such. Maybe I could have gone to Balochistan, you know, but I did talk to some uh, teachers from uh, Balochistan University. Uh, but what I got was mostly political, which is okay. I was interested in that as well, because uh, my book is basically how politics impacts popular culture but unfortunately not much came out in the end I, w I ended up just listening to Baloch music Balochi music and that too I found the songs I found were basically Baloch nationalist songs you know then I talked to or had the opportunity to talk to one of the relatives of Fez Fez Mahmoud Baloch who became very famous in the 1970s as a Baloch folk singer and I used to love his songs but again, what I got was oral history. Nothing documented, nothing, uh, uh, let's say, organized. 
but uh, I, I, that's the that's been the problem I think in this country and in 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 any in most ethnic groups I would say there are a lot of stuff which is political or nationalist is very well documented and you find a lot of stuff. But when it comes to cultural products of these ethnic groups, you all you hear are just stories and theories, but not very convincing for me to actually use it in, uh, in, 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 in a book. Great. Thank you, Nadeem. Uh, <coughs> this lady. Thank you very much, Nadeem Saab <coughs> and George Fulton. It's always a pleasure to listen to both of you. Um, you've talked about popular culture and its origins and its impact on society and also in some ways on political culture. Of uh, <coughs> several decades earlier, how would you define popular culture today uh, in terms, because you know there's a social re media revolution and the access to social media and IT and technology which influences the minds of our young people. Uh, most of all, and which they use in some very creative ways. So what would you identify as popular culture in, in today's uh, age? Let's say in the last 10, 15 years. What are some uh, defining examples of that? Again, it depends where it's coming from. Uh, most of what we see, for example, on social media, and someone I was just uh, sharing certain some uh, figures about what how many people are on Twitter and how many people on Facebook from Pakistan. It wasn't a big uh, number compared to most other countries. And most of these people were coming from my class or George's class, urban middle class and upper middle class. So... But, but not TikTok. Right. TikTok, I agree. Now, that is a fascinating thing. TikTok, yeah. I agree. Uh, mo that's much more alarming. But, but again, I, I'm glad you talked about TikTok. TikTok, I haven't uh, uh, investigated so much because it's still a very recent phenomenon. But you do see in TikTok, that I would say, if you ask me what is popular culture in digital age, and that is TikTok. Huh. That is TikTok. Because it's, it, it, it looks authentic because it's coming from people who are making a statement from their actual surroundings. Like, for example, there's a very famous uh, uh, group of three men or four young men who are basically laborers. You know, they work making buildings and they make these amazing TikTok uh, videos with music behind and it's fascinating. It's again that uh, Western uh, uh, sentimental mentality, how they see it in a tongue-in-cheek manner. But I've addressed this, what's happening on, on, on digital is when we're saying that culture which is coming from below and culture which is coming from above is now engaging. That engagement had stopped, especially from the 1980s onwards. I'll give you an example. For when cinema, when we used to have classic cinema, not multiplexes, like Nishad, Prince, that is when you saw people from all classes coming and experience the same uh, or, or enjoying the same experience. And there was some sort of interaction between classes. That stopped. Everybody in the 80s had VCRs, they went into homes. So the interaction between classes, between cultures, between ethnic groups l got limited. But social media, it's happening again. Because if I tweet something and I'm from a particular class, I'll get a reply from someone who's, uh, who's from the working class or who lives in a small town. But the engagement has started. But I would say, and I agree, what is popular culture, genuine what it, uh, popular culture in the digital age, I would say it's TikTok, definitely. Because popular culture is made by the people for the people. Uh, the lady, <coughs> oh, this gentleman, and then, and then I'll come okay. to you. Uh, hi. So my question is, how impactful do you feel independent cinema like Joyland or the likes are towards Pakistan culture today. There's been a whole lot of controversy around the whole Joyland thing. So how do you feel in the long run that impacts our culture? Problem is, I wonder, like Joyland, and uh, we now all know that Hamaka ka shor uspe bak, machata kuch hai ni usme. But how many people will go from, I think, people from my class would go and watch it because we want to patronize it, we want to promote it, we want to sort of become patrons of this sort of culture. Okay? Um, 
बट वो मूवी निषाद पे भी लगी थी शायद नो निषाद तो अब नहीं है फ्रॉम अदर आई थिंक कैपिटल कैप्री बट आई डोंट हैव द फिगर्स हाउ मैनी पीपल फ्रॉम क्लासेस बिलो वेंट एंड एक्चुअली वॉच इट I think they would find it extremely boring. They would find it extremely boring because there are certain issues which are just class based. Some issues are universal. Everybody feels them, everybody go experiences them. Then there are certain issues. Like if like for example, if you go to um uh the US and they're complaining about something and you turn around and say, "Oh, first world problems." Mm. You know? they should come and li- live in pakistan they say what exactly uh, so the issues are so th- would you say these are burger <coughs> problems well no they're not burger problem again there's a universality about it the the the, the thing they were trying to uh, address in that film joyland i haven't watched it but i've heard about it uh, it is universal uh, but if you compare it with so many other issues that we face they can be political issues they can be issues about electricity water crime whatever um people are i think more engrossed and more f- impacted by that than getting into a discussion about transgenders and stuff like that i'm not against that at all but i won't call joyland part of popular culture as such I would still call it part of some sort of a higher culture. But M- Mola Jutt is. Mola Jutt, new one I haven't seen, but I've heard that a lot of common people are going and enjoying it. So yes, Mola Jutt. Do you see Mola Jutt inherently was popular culture in its original form. Oh. So uh, thank God the director whoever made the new one didn't divert from that and try to make it make a glossy uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, but um, uh, Joyland and Zindagi Tamasha, they have th- a role to play in in culture. But I would call that culture more sophisticated, higher than popular culture. Zindagi Tamasha and Joyland, to me, is not popular culture as such. Uh, the lady in the <coughs> pink. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. All right. So my question is about populist politics that translates into popular culture, um, and obviously I'm referring to PTI and Imran Khan. Um, you know, great T-shirts, uh, memes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But do you think that um, the older mainstream parties that used to have residence in popular culture have lost the plot a little, uh, and and they no longer uh, resonate or no longer find translation into popular culture um, that obviously represents a certain class as well? No, I think the political parties are still rooted in popular culture because remember, majority of voters still come from uh, classes which are not middle class, and uh, they still root. They still make songs like, for example, PTI is the latest example. What did in a clever manner what PTI did was they took the populism of rugged populism which was first popularized by Zulfikar Ali Bhutto with those songs and 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 and, and other gimmicks, um, the malangs. The, the 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 drunk Sufi image, they took that as well, but they also added a lot of middle class sentimental uh, sentimentalities and elements in it as well. Like if you listen to um, PTI songs, you know they're far more melodic, far more softer than what was coming out of Liari, for example. But I think PTI has done something very clever because here we're talking about they are catering to a class, a middle class, which is growing rapidly. According to S. Akbar Zaidi, they're about now for 38 to 42 percent of the population is urban middle class and semi-urban middle class. So they are now producing a lot of products which we can call popular culture products. But they are, they they may not be these products may be a bit softer compared to a lot of other popular culture products like what Omar Sharif was doing, what Sultan Rahi was doing. What Aziz Mia Kawal was doing now, even Kawali has become a bit sophisticated and safer, I would say, for the middle classes. Because if you listen to Aziz Mia Kawal, uh, Aziz Mia's Kawali is of the 1970s, my Sharabi and all that. He, that man, could not have survived in this day and age. Forget about the Malvis; your middle classes would have been shocked. <laughs> you know, so I think political parties, mainstream political parties. including islamic parties now are still using a lot of popular culture products 
to to express whatever they stand for. They cannot do without it. And it's become a very, imp and this political, uh, this sort of strategy is, is, is vital, has become very vital, has, has always been very important in countries like India and Pakistan. The flags, the dancing, the songs, the uh, macho uh, rhetoric, stuff like that. So it's still there, very much there. Great. Well, that, I'm afraid, is all we have time for today. Um, it is the book launch for, f for Faith, State, and the Soul, A History of Popular Culture in Pakistan by Nadeem Farooq Baracha. And it leaves me to say thank Nadeem for uh, talking to us today. Could we give him a big round of applause? Thank you, Nadeem. Thank you, Nadeem. And thank you, thank you. Uh, George Fulton, for this wonderful, wonderful session.